The decision by the Supreme Court is procedurally, substantially flawed. And even in the merit of the law, it's a nullity. You see, the decision is an absurdity that no lawyer worth his sort can actually defend this decision in every way possible, even if it has to do with a political decision. Mm. And why do I say this? You see, there is a reason why when you attain an LLB, and you don't go to Makola to be called to the bar. You are not a lawyer because you are taught procedure. And it's a procedure that distinguishes the people who have just read law with real practitioners. Okay. And so procedural law is as important as substantive law. And so if you have a matter such as this, and both on the grounds of procedure and in substance, it is flawed, then we should be worried. And Annie, mm -hmm. we should be more worried because this is not coming from a district court. These mistakes are made by the district court. Because sometimes the district magistrates are not lawyers. Yeah. <clears throat> or even if they are lawyers, they are so young at the bar, so that we will go to the Supreme Court For... to quash the decision. Mm -hmm. But this is coming from the Supreme Court, and it's very embarrassing. I listened to um, the daughter, the daughter, I've forgotten her name, Mame Fua Mensa Bonsu, mm -hmm. who is the daughter of the Supreme Court judge. I've listened to many lawyers run commentary. Nobody can justify this. Nobody. What did Mame Fua say? Mame Fua said, this, this is wrong, except that because it's a Supreme Court decision, she was of the opinion that you have to respect it. But fundamentally, it's wrong, first of all. When you want to invoke the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, as the MPP wants us to believe they did, and you go under Article 2.1, and under Article 2.1, specifically B, it says that a person who alleges that an act or omission of any person is inconsistent with or in contravention of the provisions of this constitution may bring an action in the Supreme Court for a declaration to that effect. What everybody, including NPP and Afenio Markin, are expected to take to the Supreme Court is an act or an omission. You know the rates that they filed in the Supreme Court. That rate they filed was at best speculative. At the time they filed the writ, there was no act or omission which ought to be complained of because the speaker had not declared or had not communicated to parliament that these seats had become vacant. So they went to the Supreme Court on the basis of the intention, intention of Haruna Idris, not even the speaker. Mm. Is that why you think are you going saying you talk too much? I, I said, please. I'm trying to connect I, the dots. I, I, that's why you could, he's just gaslighting. I don't want he's to not gaslighting. He's, got, like, he's not gaslighting. He's not gaslighting. He didn't have a better He's not gaslighting. He's sharing, he's sharing what I, his senior I don't uh, have an opinion. is telling I don't you. have an opinion. Because you see, when you are governing and in law, we are looking at the lives and the law and not strategy to outweigh the system. That's not how the NDC will operate. So if they want to always outweigh the system because they think mm. we can do this, we can do this. But let me make that point. That there was no act or an omission at the time Afenyo Markin was going to court because the speaker had not made a declaration, first of all. Now, even with the filing of the defective rate, the speaker had not been served. served. And the Supreme Court, the High Court, the Court of Appeal, and all of us, whether MPP, CPP, GCPP, we know and we say it like water, that service goes to jurisdiction. So it matters not how it is done. If you have not been served, the jurisdiction of the court could not have been involved. And here, let me take you to, you know, this, the Supreme Court, there are other Supreme Court that have existed before them, and they have made decisions. In Bilson and AG, when the 1992 constitution was promulgated, 
Mr. Bilson went to court on the intention that if you look at the transitional provisions, it had the potential of preventing people who had suffered excesses from the military rule. So they wanted the court to declare that the transitional provisions were inconsistent with the constitution, which was an intention. Mm -hmm. The court said that ours is to interpret the constitution in the context of disputes. Ours is not to render advice to prospective litigants. That is the role of the solicitors in private practice. Prospective. Yes. They further stated that the principle of justiciability precludes us from giving advisory opinion based on hypothetical facts which are not part of an existing controversy. So before you would have gone to court, the speaker first of all must have, had, must have made a decision that A, and then you will say, no, we don't agree with A, we agree with B. But even before the speaker could make any decision, yeah, you have run to court. That rate, the court knew that speaker was not said. And you know, the court did something which was very strange, and we've never seen it in our practice. The court, in trying to falsely satisfy itself that indeed the speaker was served, said that they have noted from Exhibit B, which is the official report on parliamentary debates, pages 15, 16, and 17, that the Speaker of Parliament was aware that the bailiff of the Supreme Court has said, I don't know how the Supreme Court can commit this error. Because... Read it again. That pages 15, 16, and 17 of the Speaker of Parliament, that the shows ruling. that the Speaker of Parliament, this is a ruling, that the Speaker of Parliament was aware that the bailiff of the Supreme Court has served the current action on him through the legal office. His objection to the proper service of the process from the Supreme Court mm -hmm. was that it had not been served on Monday. You see, first of all, when you want to determine service, you don't go to the hands out of Parliament. You go to what we call the sworn affidavit of service. Because the bailiff can come back and tell you that even when I got to the legal department, I could not find anybody there. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you cannot rely on this parliamentary debate or the, the hands exactly. because at the next sitting, they will correct it and adopt it. So this has not even been adopted as a parliamentary hands -up. So that if the speaker or Afenio Markin himself was misquoted, they would have had the opportunity to be corrected. So why would the whole Supreme Court rely on this, contrary to all known rules of procedure, and say that they've been saved? So in the first place, in the original writ, the Supreme Court supervisory jurisdiction, uh, I, I mean original jurisdiction, had not been properly invoked. And so they should not even have assumed jurisdiction. You see, when we say justice, justice must not only be done, but must be seen to be done because the perception of you doing the right thing is as good as you doing the right thing. See. First of all, the Supreme Court does not sit on Fridays. I don't recall any time where the Supreme Court has sat on Fridays and Mondays. What is very fishy is that you ought to file a process in court. And then when you file it at the registry, you'll be given a date. What baffles me? And I want the senior lawyers to help me here. Maybe they may have practiced for 30 years. It's how a motion is filed at 10 a.m. And some way, somehow, the Supreme Court judges got to know that a motion will be filed at 10 a.m. And they had to bath and come to the court to impanel on the same Friday within a space of one hour. And then adjudicate on the matter. And the court doesn't sit. Oh, they don't sit on Friday. So there must be some special circumstance. So assuming this was even a special circumstance, my challenge is how did they even know that that morning, Afenyo Markin will bring a motion ex parte, for which reason you had judges come to the court to sit. to sit. It deepens the perception, and I would want to have answers. The third thing is that, see, why everybody is running away from this is that there is no known rule of procedure anywhere in Ghana, whether in the CI 47, the CI-16, CI-19, 
or any case law in Ghana move beyond Ghana to Kenyan and any common law jurisdiction that stay of execution should be done ex parte. There is no known procedure and the judges themselves did not show us where, which procedure or which rule. But I mean, this is where it even gets murkier. See, the applicants themselves, which is Afenyo Markin, said that they were before the Supreme Court to invoke the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court pursuant to Article 29.5. And this one, I want to invite viewers. You know, sometimes when we speak, they say it's NDC MPP. So today we will do a bit of the law without the part, because this one, I'm reading it. Article, Article 29.5. I wish you have it so that you read it for me. Uh, so they are relying on Article 29.5. 29.5. And order 19, rule 3, sub rule 3 of CI 47. Sorry. Have you found it? Just a moment. 29.5 says... 29.5. Okay, 29.5 says mm -hmm. that... Please uh, read it. In any judicial proceeding... Please read it loudly. Okay, so 29.5. In any judicial proceeding in which... A disabled person is a party. The legal procedure applied shall take his physical and mental condition into account. What is the relevance of this? That in any judicial proceeding in which a disabled person is a party to a legal procedure, the court shall take into consideration the physical and mental condition into account. Who is disabled? The Afenio marking, the speaker, or dummy? No, maybe mental condition. Wh whose mental condition? Those who Do you know there. this mental condition? I know which mental condition. Is this mental condition is people with mental issues. People who are not in law, we say they do not have capacity. So that's what the constitution says. That's is what saying. the constitution says. That's what it means. Yes, physical or mental. So the person must show physical disability or mental disability. Or mental disability. So who is disabled here? And then the Supreme Court, on the basis of this Article 29, says that, you know, and you know, there is a rule of procedure that where a, a, a lawyer or an applicant comes before you invoking a specific rule here, Article 29.5 and Order 19, 3, sub rule 3, the court is bound to go by that procedure, even if there were other provisions that would have given them the remedy. So they went to court invoking the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, special one to Article 29.5 and Order 19 <clears throat> But the Supreme Court copiously left that because they realized that they are not disabled. And then they came to Article 1294 and Rule 5 of CI 16 which in itself is also inapplicable in this case. So in the first place, how they even invoke the jurisdiction of the court in respect of the stay of execution. And you know, Annie, mm -hmm. there is something interesting that happened. You know, it's like appearing before your mother and saying, I want food, I want to eat. Look at what the last proceedings. The lawyer himself knew that the process was wrong. But even however wrong it was, he contemplated that because it's an ex parte, it will only be granted for 10 days. Yes. So he ended his submission by saying that, my Lord, if you grant me a maximum of the 10 days, we shall repeat this application for the defendant to provide justification. Mm. So the lawyer himself knows that I have not provided justification. I'm just rushing to you. But you give me 10 days. I will come to you again with the justification and hear me out on why you should even grant this stay Same. on its merit. The Supreme Court said, don't worry. You don't even need to worry about the 10-day rule. I'm granting it in perpetuity. Oh. Yes, but that's what it is. That's what it is. The rule in Dam and Addo. So even with the necessary modification says that a court cannot grant to a party release that the party has not asked for and where it is not borne out of the evidence. In this case, the lawyer himself is telling you that I know that my application ex parte did not contain enough justification. In 10 days, I'll come back and I'll give you the justification. But the court says that, oh, you know what? You don't have to worry. That 
is what we are complaining about. That is the threat to our democracy that we are speaking against. That what we have in Ghana is constitutional supremacy and not supremacy of the judiciary. When we went to law school, me, I was a favorite of the two constitutional law lectures, Professor Kumado and Professor Kote. How did you know that? Ah, because me in school, Professor Kumado will never allow anybody to hold their book except me. <laughs> what you were taught, you see, we had one case, which we all say the celebrated case of Mabry and Madison, that a person's right had been breached in law. The court said that we empathize with you. And the law has provided a remedy. The court says that, yes, you have a remedy at law. Then the court said that, oh, but you have come to the wrong court. Mm. And that, is, that has been the case. Even in the case of expert Daniels, Professor Kluche said that we have a duty to interpret the Constitution and not to replace it with what we think. Let me read that to you. He says that we cannot, under the cloak of constitutional interpretation, rewrite the constitution of Ghana. Even in the area of statutory in, um, interpretation, we cannot amend a piece of legislation because we dislike its terms or because we suppose that the lawgiver was mistaken or unwise. Our responsibility is greater when we interpret the constitution. We cannot and must not Substitute our wisdom for the collective wisdom of the framers of the Constitution. The collective wisdom of the framers of the rules of court is that every application will have to be on notice. Mm -hmm. Except as otherwise stated, there is nowhere in the rules that says that you can go to court ex parte. And then the court will grant you. You see, now on the merit. If you look at the, the holding of the court, the court even overgranted the relief and even granted relief directed to people who were not parties to the suit. Who were who? Their second point in their conclusion, number two. Parliament of Ghana is hereby directed to recognize and allow the four affected members of my, was Parliament of Ghana a party. a party to the suit. So who is to enforce this judgment? How ironic that you were seeking to um, stay an unexecutable judgment and you are directing it to a person who is not a party. So who is parliament? Who, who, who is parliament of Ghana that is to enforce this? Then you come and then you say that, you see, in all these, one of the reasons why we are granting this application is that as a Supreme Court, we believe in the Odi um, Patem law. We believe that we should hear the other party and that the speaker did not hear the other members of parliament. So the speaker was wrong. And this ruling and you yourself. And, and this ruling was before the speaker did his ruling. This was after the speaker. Ah, okay. So the speaker did not hear the other people. Okay. And so you want to crash. Okay. And yet you did not hear the speaker. I thought the rule is that he who comes to equity must come with, must come with clean hands. And, and, and then the last point, which even makes this decision so funny and nobody can defend, is the attempt to classify what happened in Parliament as a ruling. This morning, I watched a replay of Afenyo Markin and the Speaker's banter. Afenyo Markin himself kept saying that, Speaker, I have a problem with your communication to this house. So the plaintiff himself, and since, and since the court was referring to the parliamentary hands act, it would have been captured in the same hands act that both parties did not intend that that was a ruling. Really? That was a communication to the house. But assuming you even want to play the devil's advocate and say that that is a ruling, the court cannot use its powers of stay of execution of a ruling to stay any ruling that does not emanate from court. from court because you know why the speaker makes if we are to adopt the broad term of the ruling the speaker makes a ruling every day 
the decision of the speaker to adjourn the case to tomorrow is in itself a ruling. So I can go to court by this decision, ex parte, to say that I'm challenging the ruling, or any member of parliament can go to court and say that I'm challenging the ruling of the speaker to adjourn the case to Tuesday. Because I don't agree. I think on Tuesday we have better things doing. That is the, the realm of absurdity that we are getting into. into. And the Chief Justice herself, in the Dafia Mekbo case, which relates to first and second ladies taking um, salaries. salaries, said that the Dafia Mekbo case was so premature. And on the same fact, on the same law, rather gave a judgment in the Abronia case. The Abronia case came after the act has been done. So why the difference? Why is it that we sat in class with all these people and we learned the same law? And some way, somehow, we have to be gaslighted into absent law lecturers tweeting and posting that it looks like we have to reconsider the teaching of the law. I remember vividly in law school when my criminal law lecturer told me that disregard the decision in the Republic versus Satushikata because it is bad law. And every time you want to question, they will say, please, it is bad law. For how long are we going to continue? And you see, Annie, when we say the Supreme Court does not have jurisdiction, it's not just because on the basis of service, as I've already stated. I want, you to, take, I want to take you to Article 99 of the Constitution. And, and where this Constitution has not given the Supreme Court that jurisdiction. They cannot assume jurisdiction merely because they are the Supreme Court. Merely because you are the Supreme Court. You cannot just assume any baby cry application to you because the courts are actually defined, their jurisdiction are defined by law. Read Article 99.1 for me. 99.1. It says that the High Court shall have jurisdiction to hear and determine any question, any question. whether A, a person has been validly elected as a member of parliament or the seat of a member has become vacant. What are we complaining about? We are complaining about whether the seat of a person has become vacant. vacant or not. And the Supreme Court and plethora of cases have said that when it comes to issues relating to parliamentary mm. election, the high court is the jurisdiction. And you know the authority, this. Mm. 99-1. So how is it that when it comes to the same provision, when so, it comes to and, the and election... And, and take note of shall. Yes. It, it, you see, this thing is not even a, yeah, debate. It's not a debate. You know why people say that, why is it that when the ACMA thing happened in the Formula case, the NDC didn't go to court for interpretation? Mm -hmm. Because we didn't think there was a need for interpretation. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 there was nothing, and every lawyer knows. So it's now telling you that you can go to the Supreme Court on the matters of election of a member of parliament, that is the levels of absurdity. If we decide to use this as precedent. And, 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 you, you and I will file a stay of execution in the high court ex parte. I'm looking for a high court judge that will come and tell me that that is wrong. If they are not bound by the decision. You see, when we do this thing, you think you are doing it against NPP and DC. And you are wondering why your dollar is 17 CDs. It has repercussion on our international image. You are asking me why GIPC is reducing and foreign di um, direct, direct investment is reducing. The foreign companies do not trust our judiciary. I was on a Zoom call with an international client and another one from Kenya. The contract would have been executed in Ghana. You should see how ordinary people... We're quoting cases from Ghana to show why they would not agree that Ghana should be the forum for arbitration in the event of any matter. They would rather they choose Kenyan. A contract which will be enforced here, no matter the argument. So when you do this, you think, like my mother would say, you are doing me. You think you are doing the NDC. What you are doing is setting our country back. And you see, I keep saying, and I believe, and this argument, I've had this with my constitutional law lecturers, that the decisions in Tufu and Attorney General, Salah and AG, MPP and IGP, and whatever and whatever, were all political decisions. But today, 
we have come to respect those decisions as local classicals. Why? Because the judges of old stood up and saved our democracy when it mattered most. Okay. And the danger is in all these is that you see how they are throwing it in your face. That yes, however absurd you think it is, mm -hmm. however void you think it is, it is the duty of the Supreme Court to give the final decision. What will be the remedy of the citizen? When the final arbiter cannot be trusted. And you see, I'm not saying this. Kandapa told the judges in the face that when you give decisions to favor us NPP every time, you are raising the national security crisis. Mm -hmm. 